right, it looks like we are live. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Micah Vandegrift. I'm a, a librarian, the open knowledge librarian at NC State University. Uh, I'm joined by my, my friend and colleague, Sheila. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Sheila Saya. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at NC State, and I work in the bio and ag engineering department. Yeah, so uh, Sheila, I, I was thinking back on like how we got acquainted, and I guess we have to blame and or thank um, our my colleague Tisha Mitnich and um, your uh, the the what is she the the head of your lab, Natalie? Yeah, Natalie Nelson. Yeah, so we we sort of met in a in a group with the four of us talking about um, a really specific project that has developed into lots of conversations about open science, the future of scholarship, um, what are you doing, what can we do in the libraries, how, how are we doing this at NC State, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but before we get there, um, I did want to, so let's talk about tea for a second. Do you have an Earl Grey? I don't have Earl Grey, but I have tea. How could you? <laughs> what are you What are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking Constant Comment, and it's decaf because so, I already had two cups of English breakfast this morning and that's like my <laughs> limit. You love English breakfast. You had that last time too. Yes, it's my, one of my favorites. I do like Earl Grey, but um, I like putting milk in my, like I like the creamy part and I feel like weird putting Earl Grey. Uh, milk and Earl Grey. So <laughs> this this is a topic that we should talk about because so before we get there, I'll I'll plug that I do have an Earl Grey from our friends over at Global Village right across the street. Um, on I know uh, I'm I'm on campus for the first time in a long time, and it was so nice to walk over there and and get a drink. And I I would typically get the Earl Grey latte and didn't because I wanted to, you know let the, the essence of the tea uh, in, in, envelop my office. Um, so I I didn't plan to do this, but actually ended up doing a little bit of research on Earl Grey as a tea. Uh, some I'm of, excited. Yeah. <laughs> some of this is um, linked in our uh, in our GitHub repo, which will, should be in the in the chat in any second now, um, but I found okay. So there's this crazy thing that happened um, in where is this from? This is a, an article from the Lancet in 2002, and we all know the Lancet is like they never lie about science, right? Kind of, yeah. We'll see. Um, but there's a there was a, a in um, I guess it's like a, a doctor's note, a case report about a guy. It doesn't really say where he lives. Um, oh, uh, who a 44-year-old man presented to a, you know a hospital doctor, or whatever, with muscle cramps. And what happened, and like the case note kind of um, says, basically he was drinking too much Earl Grey tea. And the uh, here's the the concluding sentence. Um, Concluding paragraph: Tea is regarded as de as a delicious aromatic stimulant worldwide. However, even tea may lead to health problems if flavored and consumed in extraordinarily high quantities. Uh, and then they talk a little bit about bergamot, which is the the essence of that flavor in Earl Grey. And it says it can induce muscle cramps. Two doctor words I don't know how to pronounce and blurred vision. So. <laughs> Enjoy your Earl Grey tea, but definitely don't drink too much. Yeah, moderation. Here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so about the the Earl Grey tea latte. Tell me, you um, uh, you said that you you like to put milk in tea sometimes, right? So which, but you wouldn't do that with an Earl Grey. Yeah, I feel like with Earl Grey, it has the uh, and I think because of the bergamot, it has like a very citrusy like flavor. And I don't think that goes particularly well with milk for some reason. And I should also say that I lived in Japan for a year. And uh -huh. I think before that I would have put milk in like every tea. 
Um, but I think since living in Japan, I definitely appreciate more of like not having milk and tea and like when is good to put milk and tea and when it's not good to put milk and tea. So I feel like maybe that's also part of it too. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like there are, you, there are right ways or right times or right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. What about you? You you put milk in real okay, Are you okay with that? Yeah, typically. So uh, especially uh, working at home, c COVID life, um, I'll have a, like a, a 10 o'clock tea and it's usually Earl Grey. And this may be sacrilegious to anyone listening um, from, from the UK, but I'll put like a, a French vanilla flavored uh, like creamer. Because for me, that that um, that citrusiness does mix well with that French vanilla so it, it makes a really yeah, it's nice. like especially in winter it's like a warm comforting those are all the flavors and feelings that i want to have inside you know uh we yeah. have a, uh, some uh in our chat foggy yeah we we didn't know either that there would could be dangers of too much tea but it's published in the lancet so we i guess we have to uh believe in it ah coconut milk roxanne says coconut milk i haven't tried that 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 might be something um that we can try in the future. So I okay. One more research thing because uh, because I'm a librarian, I can't help myself. But I found what is this? The Tea and Coffee Trade Journal. Uh, when is this from? Uh, April 2018, a couple of years ago. Talked about the art of the tea latte, and they say, hey, this is a trend. Lots of people are interested in it. What is a tea latte? We sort of know what that is. This is the detail, Sheila, that I think we both need to contend with. Um, they say in this article in the Tea and Coffee Trade Journal that, of course, you know, that it's probable that in the 1800s in India, um, mixing tea with hot milk, that is a, a thing. And they talk about chai, which we'll talk about in our upcoming, uh, what is it, two weeks from now, I think. But they say that in Seattle, in the 1990s, Starbucks coffee introduced the chai latte and then propelled the, what do they say? Propelling a then niche beverage concept to the mainstream. So I, I'd, I'd love to hear from other people from other parts of the world um, about the mixing of milk with teas, right? Um, but our, our friends at the, the Coffee and Tea Trade Journal say, we need to blame it on Starbucks. <laughs> At least the, the mass popularization of it, uh, especially in the U.S. here. That's my, <laughs> that's my research. So uh, that's everything we know about Earl Grey. Um, okay, so on, on to the, the topic at hand. Um, we wanted to put together this uh, series of discussions, Open Science and Reproducibility. Um, because, well, for lots of reasons, I'll tell some of mine and then Sheila, you can tell some of yours, but I, um, had the opportunity to visit Oxford University. Um, it would have been October of 2019 now. Um, and they have a, a, a great and widely established reproducibility, um, group, I guess, not really a research group, but a, a collective. Um, and I was really inspired to get to meet with someone and have a conversation about it and, it's really inspired by the work that they were doing, and one aspect of that has been this uh, global um, establishment of journal clubs that they call Reproducibility-T, right? Um, so that's where the, the concept came from, and um, people all around the world are putting up these journal clubs and um, in pre-COVID times, gathering together, drinking tea, uh, talking about an article or something in the broad reproducibility or open science world. So. We had talked about Sheila doing a um, intro to open science workshop here at NC State, and I was thinking, hey, maybe there's a. Um, I, I don't want to. I didn't want to prepare slides and you know click through them and present them to fifteen or twenty people. So I was like, what's a different version of this? What's a different way we could do this? So that's how we have ended up here. Um, could you talk maybe for a couple minutes about your broad interest in open science or reproducibility? Yeah, I think I kind of stumbled into open science and reproducibility in grad school. And I, 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 there was a class um, that I took that was like a, like a mini class. And I think it was like six weeks for a couple hours each week. And it was um, taught by a librarian at the university library and like a faculty member. 
um, in, I think in like a natural resources department. And they, it wasn't, the class was actually on like data management, but I think they started to like hint at some of these, like definitely reproducible research principles, but also like started to hint at like open science. And I feel like for me, the open science part just, I was like, this makes sense. Like I'm getting my funding for this research from the public, like via funding agencies, like in the US here, we have the National Science Foundation or for my work, I do a lot of like agricultural, like water resources type work. And so I'm getting funding from the US Department of Agriculture in some cases. And like, it just makes sense that like the data I produce should be open um, and that also like, just as a scientist, like people should be able to reproduce like the work that I do. And so I think I've always sort of been thinking about it since then. Uh, and then um, I've always learned a lot from librarians uh, about like different aspects of open science and reproducible research. So when you were like, can we talk about this more? I was like, yes, I, I love that. Um, so, and I think just like, sometimes I lose sight of a lot of things, like when I'm in the weeds on like a particular project or like trying to figure out, you know, uh, what type of structure to use for a database or something, but like, it's helpful to step back in like a place like this and just be like, yeah, what, uh, like what are the bigger picture questions and things um, regarding these topics? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I, um have some great colleagues at the library that um, at, can actually do uh, open science and reproducibility. For, for me, it's um, I'm really interested in the, the topics and issues around this, right? Like, what does this mean for, um, so like, I, I try to characterize my, the, the research that I do and the best phrase that I've come up with so far is meta research. And that's a, you know, that's another developing concept out there and across the, the landscape. Um, but I'm really interested in, in research about research and, and how, um, yeah, what's happening, how it's changing, what are we doing? Um, and reproducibility is a topic there, of course, too. Um, let's, let's dig into gray literature. So um, we, uh, in, in previewing these topics, I was really just thinking of clever puns on teas and um, topics in, in the in the world and stumbled on that the, the phrase um, Earl gray literature but but gray literature is a thing um, I have a pretty I have a, I have a concept of it from um, approaching it from my discipline and in information science um, do you hear ha, have you heard that heard do, that word do you hear that word um, that phrase gray literature what does it mean? Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess I had always, like, I feel like it's, I think of it sort of synonymously with like white papers. And I feel like, yeah, it's definitely uh, it, basically like in between, like along the continuum of like, just someone maybe like writing in their notes in their notebook to like a fully published and peer reviewed paper. It's like in between those, but I feel like it still can be like a pretty, at least my idea of gray literature is like still a pretty broad uh, like degree of variation between like writing in a notebook or writing on like Evernote or whatever note taking app you use um, and like actually publishing the results. Mm -hmm. um, now, w when you say notebook, do you, are you meaning like, um, like lab notebooks? Yeah. Yeah. Or like a journal or something like that, whatever, where you're writing notes to yourself about like things that you're going to write about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the um, in from from lib from libraries, I guess I can't even remember where I first might have encountered the term. I guess so. A lot of my early work was around institutional repositories, right? Which are um, like um, at when I was at Florida State, we had a a repository where scholarship and things from Florida State could be uh, put there. So I think that's probably where I encountered it first, um, and. 
we, we do have an official definition from the Fourth International Conference on Gray Literature, which we need to note was a long time ago, 1999. But how they define gray literature is... Um, quote here, that which is produced on all levels of government, academics, business, and industry, in print and electronic formats, but which is not controlled by commercial publishers. And that's the, that's the sentence that I think we need to hit on. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a lot yeah. now that, you, that, and I'd love to hear you talk about your work, there's a lot that you do that is not controlled by commercial publishers. I think that that's probably still the goal, right? That there would be a publication, but um, I, I'm doing like Zoom stuff, like I'm, you know, inside this window. Um, there's the published paper, right? And then there's all this stuff that happens before it. Um, yeah. Could you describe um, like what is that stuff before a published paper for, for you and, and for your work? Yeah, I think, I mean, like just kind of getting back. So it's like, you know, your lab notebooks, um, like outlines. Um, it could be like even like, I guess like data in lab notebooks. Like I'm just thinking like when you got into the field, sometimes you don't bring like electronic devices because you don't want to drop them in the stream. At mm, least sure, for me. sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that stuff always happens. So you're just like, I will just leave this phone in the truck <laughs> or lab vehicle. Um, so yeah, like, you know, a notebook that you have in the field uh, with measurements that you've taken, or um, if you're, I don't do like interviews, but if you're interviewing folks, like all the transcripts from those, um, and then just like summaries of the transcripts, summaries of your lab notes, and then just like all the stages of publications and maybe even like if you have readme files like for data sets things like that i mean that's not uh like publish like a publisher doesn't really touch those things so yep, yep. like all of that and then i guess where it's a little bit of gray <laughs> gray area in the gray <laughs> literature is like um you know like so for example i have a paper that is published, but then I also have a preprint. Yeah. And so that is sort of like that preprint is by definite, like it's not formatted by the journal, uh, but it is like my writing that went into the final version of that published paper. And so that, I guess, technically the preprint is like gray literature. But it's also, in the case like a preprint has been published, then it becomes like not gray literature. That's, so that could that, be confusing. Yeah, well, that's the question yeah. at hand, right? Because um, I, I do want to point out that Roxanne has, has discovered, as I did also, that the uh, International Conference on Gray Literature, th their website is, there's some stuff there and, and people should go and explore that. Um, I don't know if that conference is actually still going. Maybe, Sh Sheila, we, we have a, a NSF proposal to... Uh, um, <laughs> explore gray literature but yeah so the question about preprints is a really complicated and interesting one and kind of where we wanted to head with this conversation because um it's clear now and I, and so th this was most clear to me in looking at your website right so we we met with, with tisha and natalie um, a while ago and i was doing my homework and found your website and on your website, you have, you know, here's publication, projects, publications, et cetera. And so there would be a, a citation of a publication and, you know, find it online and a different little icon, preprint, a PDF, and then sometimes um, data set connected uh, to the publication. So that was the clearest, um, and I, lots of people do that, but, but uh, since you're here with me, that was the clearest I've seen of you delineating that there is a difference between these things um, but value in all of them which I think is is really cool and so the question about preprints if we're going to go with our our standard definition here is right now currently you know 2020 2021 preprint uh, the the 
the practice of preprint sharing, which we should define in a second, is not controlled by commercial publishers. So the 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 publication of the thing, the final published uh, version with the um, a Wiley or Springer logo at the top of it. Um, that is controlled by publishers, and that process, the peer review, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but preprints, when I, um, uh, you know, I'm doing research on, uh, I'm trying to think of a topic from your work. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm doing research on COVID, um, and that information needs to be out as quickly as possible. And I yeah. put it on BioArchive or MedArchive, or if I'm in the humanities, I'll put it in Humanities Commons or um, SSRN, you know, there's a, a variety of platforms that are out there right now that aren't controlled by publishers that are sort of academy owned um, infrastructure, open infrastructure. Um, so is, is that the future of gray literature? Is gray literature, um, and maybe like a different part of the question is, how much do we continue to resist the control of commercial publishers for gray literature I don't you don't need to that's a big question you don't need to answer that but any of those questions that I've posed feel free to jump in <laughs> yeah I, I feel like I mean for me just the preprints are maybe one part of the gray literature right like there's still all that other stuff like yeah I was also just thinking as we were talking like there's like the blog post that people write or the you know, the read me files or like, I'm just thinking there are quite a few researchers, at least in the like coding software development sphere that like, you know, they've produced this, um, like I, I use R, the programming language R quite a bit. And so we have these like sets of code that people compile for a particular like theme and they create like what's called an R package with like all that code grouped together. And so like there are researchers that develop these like packages of code and like that and maybe they don't actually write like a paper mm -hmm. about that. Right. But that I think could technically be like gray literature too. Um, and then yeah, like blog posts, even like and we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later, about like the proposals mm -hmm. and like all of the documentation that goes into like writing a proposal to get support to do your research like all that too so i feel like yeah gray literature is quite big but yeah yeah i definitely think i mean i hope that and i think that i see this just from like the journals that i'm submitting to it's like there are, there's a bigger and bigger push to have like literature be open access um and that journals be offering that option to, uh, you know, folks like me, because I think, and then I think in the case where like, for example, you can't afford the open access fees, which can be quite high, like there's always the preprint. Um, and I just to preface this, like a non-proprietary preprint server, mm -hmm. um, which you could, I haven't actually, found a proprietary preprint server, but I've heard that they exist. So yeah, and I'm, know, maybe you could answer more of that. But, um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm sure that's in our near future. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So, well, let me, let's back way up. So you, you mentioned white papers way back, right? So we're, we're talking in the, the, the shades of, of grayness of, of scholarly literature. Um, I, I hear people talk about white papers uh, I assume I read them. I have a, a report on my desk here. Um, can you, or, or, I'll, I'll ask you, okay, have you contributed to a white paper or the other categories I'm thinking of in my head are like technical reports or, you know, here, here at NC State, we have a a, a, a huge enterprise in our extension office that puts out all kinds of extension reports on on a variety of topics, right? Um, so t tell me about white papers and maybe technical reports or like how how is that stuff valuable? How is it different than a published journal article? Yeah, I think before I said that, I think of white papers as synonymous with gray literature and maybe, you know, I'm thinking about that wasn't actually 
correct it from what I was thinking about it. So yeah, I think white papers actually, I feel like those are in my mind actually more synonymous with like a preprint hmm. and they might have, and I generally think of them in disciplines like in the social sciences as them like, uh, like before the preprint like craze came to the sciences, like social scientists were doing um, their version of preprints, which were these white papers. Mm. And so I think, uh, yeah, like in, in the sciences, at least in my field, like I think that the preprint is very similar to like a white paper where you're kind of like, you're getting your ideas out there, you're asking for feedback. Um, and it's like, happens before you or maybe while you're in the process of submitting hmm. that work um, and it's really like yeah to be like this is an idea that I have and what do you all think uh, I'm going to share it with you and then like please get back to me and like let me know so even like broadening the peer review I guess hmm. um, that's another benefit of preprints I think yeah yeah uh, there was another question you asked me like. Um, ju yeah, just thinking like technical reports. Like I, um, oh, yeah, so com com reports. coming from Florida State, which, which is a historically um, uh, a liberal arts school that that became a university, um, I had never been around extension. Right, we weren't the the ag school in Florida, um, and then I came here and I, I heard people talking about technical reports. And I, I still don't know if I could tell you what a technical report is or what the difference between a white paper, a technical report, um, yeah, conference proceeding, you know. So d is that something you've encountered or worked with at all? Yeah, I I mean, I definitely have experience, like, using, like, citing technical reports and mm -hmm. things like that. I guess in, in my field, I feel like technical reports tend to come from, like, government agencies mm -hmm. or, like, uh, like, consortiums of universities and government agencies and sorry for the dog barking <laughs> and um <laughs> and also i feel like uh they are very much it's like maybe even a, like to get a technical port out to the public there are like i think a lot of steps that these government agencies have to go through like internal review and external review. And I know that's true for like extension fact sheets too. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think that that's a lot, there's a lot more rigorous review. Um, it's not specifically like a review that's being overseen by like a publisher, but it's like review that's being overseen by like an agency or group of agencies or agency and university or institution collaborations. Hmm. So that's kind of how I think of like technical reports. Hmm. Like I'm just thinking like, for example, there's a technical report that I often come back to that the US Geologic Survey put out back in like the early 2000s, which basically is like a national assessment of like water quality and so those technical reports can do, like, can often be really great, like, synthesis, syntheses yeah, yeah. Um, of data. So I think, yeah, um, and, like, just, like, the climate assessment, I, w I think of, like, the national climate assessment, uh, at least for, these are all, like, you know, specific to my field, but, like, those are technical documents that, you know, hours and hours of review have gone into before they make their way to the public, but there's not like a publisher that's overseeing that. Yeah. yeah. That, no, that's really interesting. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask any of our viewers slash listeners, uh, I hope some of you are eating lunch and not watching us, but, um, feel free to chime in. What, what's the difference between a white, white paper, technical report? Are you considering this stuff gray literature? Um, we want to. We want to know. Call in. Oh, I forgot to do our theme song. Uh, I'll do it at the end. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to hear. <laughs> but I wanted to pick up on a phrase that you said that I think is is a, this might be the um, the 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 thing. 
you said that um, technical reports, the purpose is uh, getting that information out to the public. Um, I think that might be true also of white papers. Um, I think that might be less true of preprints because of that they're, they're still written as, you know, academic language, you know. Um, so maybe, um, uh, so when I describe my job, so like um, uh, my, my family doesn't really understand what I do, right? They, they hear librarian and they think a certain thing. When I describe my job, usually the phrase that I say is that my role is to help um, a campus community uh, translate and interpret um, academic knowledge to the public. And that, like that translation and interpretation thing is really exciting to me because um, it's, it's not that I'm write, writing press releases for people, right? But it's that um, I'm really interested in talking with you about ways that are appropriate for your career and your, the stage of your career um, to take something you're excited about that you're working on and find a way to disseminate that, right? So that could look like preprints, that could look like a blog post, it could, I think, um, Natalie and, and, and the lab, the biosystems, what lab, what's it called? Analytics lab. That one. Yep. I think you, yeah. all, you all do a great job of, of sort of doing some of that translation work already. I think I've, I've seen it a lot across our campus already. Um, so uh, let's, let's, I'm going to pose a, um, a finer point on how we might define gray literature, and this this can cannot be true, but maybe a um, a thing that gray literature is supposed to do, or or, or um, is available to do for the world, is to translate academic ideas in a different way, right? So we we write for our peers and colleagues in in hydrology or information science or or history, um, and those are academic journals and uh, conferences and, you know, those sorts of things. And then there's this other, I, and I would call it sub subterranean right now, layer of knowledge and information that is distributed and porous out to the world um, that maybe has been called gray literature. But I think that we're getting at maybe there's a new phrase or there's a bigger concept that we should be using to describe that stuff. Um, so let me uh, yeah, something that's like more catchy than like gray literature it's just gray just sounds so like meh yeah like but, it's like it's less it's than like in right? the middle right. yeah exactly because yeah. exactly. it's just it is like very important especially like for what you were mentioning like to get to to help like as a scientist the research I do like I, I do it with the public in mind you know so it's just like um i think that's like a very important piece like the you know like okay the you know i've gotten support from the public now i'm going to support them in return with this gray literature that i'm uh creating yeah yeah we um, I, I'm with you there. That's that's why I love having this conversation with you. So we ha we have a comment from a wood sa sand wood sand, um, saying is obsessed with gray literature. There's a strand of in the study of gray literature that uses reports literature as a broad category, and under that is distinguished by the audience. Interesting. Ah, defined by being temporary. Um, this will take us down a, a, a deep rabbit hole, but. Uh, an, another uh, area of work that I'm involved in is um, ha has historically been called digital humanities or digital scholarship, and um, we're talking a lot right now in that field about um, the ephemerality of like embracing the ephemerality of some of the um, things that are living online and online only, right? Which um, we 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 can't keep everything forever, which is okay, yeah. um, and and so I'm I'm excited about like okay how do how do we embrace ephemerality and so some of the um, points that are being raised in that discussion on on that side of my field is about documentation so we if we can be better at documentation about ephemeral things and I think this is where maybe lab notebooks will be really um, helpful and interesting to talk about that documentation becomes the um, 
part of the scholarly record, a phrase we haven't used yet today, but one that I'm really interested in. Um, is there a question? There, there? was an interesting question in the chat about, um, like, are there use cases for technical reports in the humanities? I'm probably not the best person to ask, but I just Googled it and I found <laughs> Carnegie Mellon's Department of Philosophy does have like a technical report repository, like on their webpage. So yeah. maybe it's, I, I should admit that I was thinking, um, I think it's like technical in the sense of like, uh, like very detailed study of something in a particular field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's a report on that. But yeah, like um, also Woodson says like in the chat that, yeah, it's, there are these reports and um, there are maybe different fields call different reports, different things, but yeah, and they're all reports, and you know, re reviewed by other people in their fields, and yeah, and, and some review yeah. th things that become really valuable to the conversation of a field that aren't, if we go back to our definition, controlled by the commercial publishers. Um, so we could we could go and talk about yeah. So like in philosophy, there's a a repository called Phil Papers, right, which um, does a lot of the same things that Archive has done for for. Um, for physics and statistics and math. Um, so, I, yeah, okay. Let me raise a different question. Have you? Do you ever teach? Have you? Have you taught? Like a like a yeah. You do a class, yeah. Not like a full class, but I've like helped teach. Okay. Like, and then taught like parts of classes. Yeah. yeah. So in in the humanities, I think, and this is um um. I think folks in the humanities often can be um more comfortable sharing things like syllabi, uh, modules of a lesson plan, um, th things that, in, in, that are informed by their research efforts but are happening in a classroom environment, you know? Um, yeah. And that becomes documentation that leads to a monograph over, you know, two, three years because you're working out those ideas in a classroom and, you know, undergrads, graduate, um, it, even with colleagues. Um, so there's a, I mentioned it a, a little while ago, but there is a, a, a thing, a platform called Humanities Commons that I think is meant to be that hub for the humanities yeah. for, and I don't know if they use the phrase gray literature. Uh, I could look it up in a second, but, um, but it's meant to capture all that extra stuff that really is valuable to field building. Oh, maybe that's what we're really talking about. Is how do we build fields, um, and then what are the things, the the building blocks that become, yeah. Oh man, okay, we went. That's a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's. I I feel like. <laughs> I feel like a lot of times, on like I'm on um like I have a Twitter account and so I often like find it very helpful when someone was like, hey, like, okay, so I'm a hydrologist, I study like water processes. And someone will be like, hey, help me Twitter hydrology people, like, yeah. what are some R computer coding, like work, workflows or like, um, workshoppy type things that I could do for my class. And then they'll have, you know, like, everyone will list like all these resources that they use. But I still think like, at least in my field, and I know there have been some efforts to collate like lesson plans and things like that. Hmm. But I still think that there is, I don't know of like, a, like a commons type space hmm. uh, where people save that. And it, it's, I, I will be, it will be so interesting to know if there is one and I would love to look at it. Um, but I think, and like also point people to it um, when I see them ask questions like that on Twitter. But yeah, that's a, that's a I good think question. It is tricky. Yeah. I think that that's um, so. I'm thinking of things like data carpentry or software carpentry that have sort of filled that space, right? Where there there is a shared curriculum. Um, so if if someone needs to learn how to um, uh, do P Python for genomics, that lesson exists, 
right? Yeah. Um, so I think maybe the Carpentries are a player in, in that space. Um, you brought you, one of your questions on our um, yeah, on our discussion. About the yeah, but but so like pre-registration. Right, which I think is happening. We can we should define that in a second. I keep saying that we should define that in a second, but I want to finish my idea. Um, the pre-registration I think is is maybe trying to do some of that also. Um, there's a a tangential movement in open science about open methods, right? I think we're, we're pre-registration starts to align there. So all those things are 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 cool and good and valuable and are starting to find ways to be collected and gathered and this is the the phrase about the scholarly record is how do we decide what should be collected and gathered and then how does it become part of knowledge that that moves forward in history um where was i going the you're what do we do if twitter ends Right, like so, uh, I I was re-reviewing this. I think this is linked on our our. Sh I'm just gonna keep calling them show notes, but so this this paper from the knowledge knowledge exchange was one of these foundational reports that I um, had been paying attention to preprints for a while, and they've done a really good job of summing it up. The transformative role of preprints. This is from September of 19. But one of the points that they make in in this in the report is. Right now, or, or you know, September of nineteen, and I think w would still be true now. There's such a dependence on um, social media, t Twitter, to be the megaphone for um, communities, right? So the the our community, uh, the data carpentry community, the digital humanities community, um, and so our dependence on that. Um, is changing our fields and how we do field building, how we recognize knowledge. But maybe we shouldn't be dependent on that thing. Yeah, I mean, the downside of that is, yeah, like, what if Twitter goes away? But the other thing is, like, this happens to me so many times where it's like, oh, there was that thread mm -hmm. on Twitter mm -hmm. that was so awesome. <laughs> and, like, I thought I saved the link somewhere in my email or like on Evernote, but now I can't find it yeah. and I don't remember where it was. And now it's like lost forever. And I'm just like frustrated. <laughs> I know. I can't find it. I know. So, I do the same. Yeah. So it's just like, like organizing that stuff. But I go, I guess I had totally forgotten about the carpentries and I'm sorry, the carpentries. Cause <laughs> I really, really <laughs> love the carpentries, but I do think like they do have the lesson plan, so like those, lessons right but then I still haven't found or seen like a place where people are like this is a syllabus I've developed and like tag it for these topics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like share it when I think that could be really valuable like, yeah for a lot of people could I know that the the p4 project is sort of on hold could, do you want to go there and talk about that for a second because i think that's a good example of uh, this is the project that um natalie uh nelson dr dr nelson uh tisha sheila and i first started talking about that's a great example of we have a, sh a shared idea of a curriculum a way to train um ag uh students in data science techniques right um can you recap that project, maybe your involvement with it, um, where we were, what we were thinking about when we talked about it a little while ago. Yeah, I think so. I'm having, it's like I'm trying to remember what the P four stands for. It's I'm gonna like look it up. Pigs, poultry, poultry. It's like related to agricultural. I'm um, almost there. Pigs, poultry, oh. the planet, and data-driven problem solving. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's, and it's this research experience for undergrads that was funded through the NSF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an R R E U. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So R E U it stands for research experience for undergrads, and so it happens in the summer, and they have a call for undergrads to join. Or, or to apply um, to this program. And it's 
like the general theme is like ag data science. And right, so right. students will come to NC State and get this experience in like ag data science. But so so they're doing like their own independent projects, but they're also like learning about ag data science too during this like eight week program, I think. And so Natalie's idea was to like capture the training materials that like go into that and then somehow share that on like an existing portal where we like where like people shared lesson plans and I think we found a few portals like I remember we talked about cube hubs which is q u e b Did yeah I that right? uh, I'll get it yeah maybe Claire you could <laughs> or yeah Mike Claire in the chat the library um and but that one I think I don't know if they had like there was something it was like not a direct fit and then there had but we found Natalie and I found another portal but it was like fairly old and it didn't look like people were still contributing contributing to it yeah so um that, that's a so, yeah that's a yeah. great point about your um your question earlier that like there should be a place where this kind of stuff could be gathered um there sort of is for some things um but some of the conversations that we had with natalie was is this a proposal to the nsf to say wait there there isn't a place for this kind of stuff um should we put it somewhere in the um in the library world and this is another branch of the open science tree we tend to call those things um or, or we, we have an umbrella under which we situate those things that we call open educational resources oer um which has a whole community and it's on the uh, open teaching and learning and open pedagogy side of things um some of the challenges with OER is often they're they're still thought of as textbooks, right? So encapsulated things that can be broken apart and modularized, um, but um, do, doesn't necessarily have to be. And some of the data science curricula, like like what P4 represents, um, are meant to be modular and continually developed and um, extended, right? And and um, transported to different disciplines so what do we do with as a, as a as a strange category of gray literature what do we do with um yeah things that don't fit anywhere where do where do we put them yeah hmm. i don't know mm -hmm. this is when we should like call a we need to phone a friend. Open who, science education. <laughs> <laughs> who who would you call? Who's who's okay? I don't know. Like you and I are um, open science people on campus. Uh, I mentioned Tisha already. Uh, we have a great. I, I do. A... Go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. I do have. There's uh, her name is Dr. Mina Chitakayarandel, who is a that faculty member at Duke University. Hmm. And she's also works at our studio as like on their education team. So she's the first person I would call, but I don't know if she would know all the specifics for all fields. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, uh, I feel like we should start concluding. Maybe we don't have to, but um, one thing, so I spent some time in, in Europe a couple of years ago now um, studying open science, how they're doing open science in Europe. And one of my main takeaways was we um, should continue and keep trying to establish a sort of a, a, a overarching open science thing, right? That is includes things like reproducibility, data management, open access, gray lit, pre-publication, pre whatever. But probably the best way forward is um, discipline specific. So anthropology should develop its own 
um, version of of what gray literature is and how to capture and and kind of you know make it make it move forward and anthropology is a good example because they're already doing some of that hydrology um could do a version of that um i'm a big fan of that that openscapes uh project out of the pacific northwest somewhere do you, do you know detail washington university of washington university of Santa Barbara. Maybe. Oh, oh, I was way off. The city of California, Santa Barbara, I think. Yeah, Julia Stewart Lowndes. Um, but I, I think that's a great example of um, a disciplinary solution for open science. Oh, it's called, it's at openscapes.org, I believe. Um, but um, yeah, so we should all be aiming toward. Uh, open and and there is a, a sort of big umbrella of open um, that includes some of the practices that we've discussed today, but probably there will be disciplinary solutions all along, and then we get into some of the challenges we always have about well what's the difference between hydrology and whatever the closest next field is to you right and where's the the next yeah. umbrella up right. Yeah, and I, I definitely think that, like, at least for me, I see some of the, like, professional societies mm -hmm. uh, as helping to shape these initiatives and, like, partnering with people. Because I think, like, so the, prof the major professional society that I participate in is the American Geophysical Union. Yeah, which is and a they, great, great example, yeah. Yeah, and they definitely have, like their journals have like their we were going to talk about conference posters so they actually have like a non-proprietary preprint server for their papers like in their journals but they also allow researchers that submit posters to their conferences to put their p posters on that preprint server too awesome so there are like things that are happening in that world and i think or like just thinking about the Geologic Society of America, like I'm sure they have sort of wheels turning regarding, you know, syllabi collection, how to keep, get those open and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. I'm glad glad you brought that up. So a lot of the, um, again, sort of mega level conversations about open science has started to lean toward. Okay, so if we uh, let's go back to our definition. If if this isn't about control by the commercial publishing industry, then it is about control by the academy. And historically, that has been societies, associations, um, groups of colleagues in a field or discipline getting together to to yeah sh share ideas, but also to solve problems that are um, facing that field or that discipline. So yeah, the focus on um, there is a study ongoing. Uh, I'm not going to get any of it right. It's maybe out of the UK, but it's a, it's about how societies and associations um, can or are responding to the the open future. I think Alma Swan is maybe one of the lead authors there. Um, okay, I, I feel us winding down. Maybe it's just because I haven't eaten lunch yet. We um, should still define pre-registration before. Go Go, no. would, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, I'm still learning about it. So prefacing with that caveat, but a friend of mine, um, hydrologist friend of mine, um, Dr. Tim Van Emmerich, he told me about pre-registration in the meeting that I had, and I had never heard of it until before that. It was probably like last year, actually. Hmm. But it's this idea of... Um, like in, it's almost similar to a preprint, but it's like you would basically post the proposal or things that thoughts that went into like coming up with the proposal on some sort of like pre-registration server, almost like we have these preprint servers, non-for-profit preprint servers. We have these non-for-profit pre-registration servers. And so I think the the idea behind those is that uh, you get sort of like an inside look into people into researchers like motivations and uh, like motivations for a particular project, 
and also like the assumptions that they go that go into like the research questions that they're proposing be answered by the research that will be carried out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i i think it also like is being picked up by uh so i have a good friend that always talks about like how we should be publishing null results yeah Yep. There should be like journals for null results so we don't keep making like the same mistakes over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Because typically the you know, typically journals they wanna like they want to publish things that are Yeah, they like, want not novel and groundbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. So if something doesn't work or there's no significant finding, like that's also a finding too. Mm -hmm. And so um, valuing that too so i think the the pre-registration can also help with that like you're setting up like the scope of a project and defining that mm -hmm. and then if if it you know turns out that you learn something you didn't expect like either way then mm -hmm. um you can you have a record of that like yeah. what your motivation was yeah yeah, one of the cool things that I've seen about pre-registration is um, a, a common fear that I, that I hear on the library side about open in general is the, the scooping factor, right? So if I put something out in a conference presentation that goes on a, on a, um, a you know, a, a website somewhere, someone's going to find that, scoop my research, and then I, I don't do anything or I don't get any credit. But pre-registration is sort of like that, how do I want to say this, that claim staking saying this yeah. is the study that we're about to undertake um here's our protocols methods etc cetera, etc cetera. um the pre-registration server that i'm that i'm aware of i'm sure there may be others is sort of sponsored through the center for open science out of charlottesville um that assigns sort of a a, a url and a way to capture and say we're about to do this thing and the data will come out at some point and the preprint will come out at some point and then the paper will come out. And it's not that anyone else can't also do that same research. This is getting at some of the replication problem of, uh, especially in the psychological sciences, but we won't go, we're, we're not those people, so we won't go there today. Um, anyway, pre-registration, I think is, a, is another cool example of future thinking, gray literature, gray, we need a new term. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're not going to solve that one. Um, oh, is there any last thoughts or comments uh, on our free-ranging conversation about that was supposed to be about Earl Grey literature and is also about the future of scholarship? Any last thoughts, Sheila? Last thoughts. I mean, I thank you for the like little snippets on Earl Grey. I hadn't <laughs> heard of that before. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll keep talking about preprints and gray literature. Um, but I think, yeah, I just, I think it's definitely, especially in like open science, I think, you know, talking more about like how we open those types of information more uh, and and um, are transparent about the work that we're doing. Uh, yeah, I think that's a big motivator for me. Yeah, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, my, and my concluding statement is um, all about incentives. We have to find a way to... Um, the incentives right now all rest on a journal publication in Nature, Science, The Lancet, whatever. We have to address the incentive um, challenges, especially for early career researchers like yourself, so that the kind of work that you're doing already um, with with our development, with preprints, um, conferences, is recognized uh, and, and validated and, and valued in in your um, getting a job and a tenure promotion case and all of that. So incentives is a thing that we need to get to. 
Okay, I'm going to, uh, let's call it there. I did want to say thank you to Claire Cahoon, who has been our expert uh, moderator and getting us all set up to stream on Twitch. Um, Sheila and I will be back next Wednesday, uh, 12 Eastern, um, and uh, hope other people will join us. Oh, and I had one last thing that I wanted to show. Um, Sheila, have you ever seen one of these? Uh -uh. Okay, so this is a mustache cup, <laughs> right? Because in the old days, guy, <laughs> guys had mustaches like that, and if you're going to drink your tea, <laughs> you got to do something, right? So a friend of mine, I, I didn't know these existed, but um, a friend of mine saw it at some random, you know, antique shop or something. So I have like three of these now. That's um, awesome. I didn't drink my tea out of this today because I keep it, you know, on my desk in here. But that's so cool. I was like, "Is it a straw holder?" It, I was like, "Why it could would you be. be drinking tea with a straw?" <laughs> <laughs> Maybe iced tea. <laughs> iced tea, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to talk about kombucha. I'll definitely cliffhanger. You'll get to see some kombucha. Yeah, excited. Next week is open knowledge kombucha. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay sheila thank you so much this has been fun thank you micah thanks claire and thanks to our viewers slash listeners bye-bye <laughs>